you. Um, as you can immediately see, I have probably have too many slides here. Um, so thanks to the organizers for the uh, uh, allowing me to speak to you on this uh, subject. Uh, it's uh, rather strange maybe when we're talking about new innovations for me to be talking to you about the oldest anti-tuberculosis drug that there is. Um, I'm going to t tell you a, a little bit of history. Uh, before, the, the, these are my co-workers um, whom I thank and I thank in particular the National Research Foundation of South Africa for supporting some of this. Okay, so I'm going to give you a bit of a historical background to tell you where our research fits in uh, and also to elucidate where our or attempt to elucidate where our current uh, dosage recommendations for PAS come from. And then to tell you towards the end about our original research with PAS and the influence uh, of the dosage on, um, <coughs> on t t tolerance and the influence of genes. Okay, so you, an alternative title here, and I'm just starting my stopwatch so that we can see that I don't go over the time, and um <laughs> uh, could be a reconsideration of the current uh, dosing recommendations for PAS. We start right at the beginning with this man, Jorge Lemon, who was a Dutch doctor, ph physician working in Sweden, uh, who was the discoverer of PAS, and he started his first clinical trials of PAS in March 1944, about a month before streptomycin was used. It was this paper that precipitated it. Frank Bernheim, an American researcher, who was culturing mycobacteria, and he gave some salicylate to, to the, uh, added some salicylate to the culture media, and stimulated the oxygen uptake. And immediately, Jorge Lemon, who was uh, experienced in uh, blocking enzymes, saw that there was a potential for a compound which might block the activity of that pathway. So he designed, he took uh, the aspirin, put an amino group down here at the para position, and then we had para amino salicylic acid. Now, obviously, it was much more difficult than this, but uh, that's very simply what happened. In the early 50s, the British MRC conducted a series of trials which threw quite a lot of light on how we should dose our early anti-tuberculosis drugs. So here's a 1950 paper where they looked at PAS alone, streptomycin alone, and the combination of PAS and streptomycin. Their main concern was the, pr was the protection of streptomycin against resistance. I ask you to note the dosage of PAS, 20 grams in four equal doses, so each dose here was five grams. And the outcome after six months, the PAS streptomycin group, not unexpectedly, fared better. Negative sputum cultures in about a quarter of the PAS streptomycin patients and somewhere over 10% for the streptomycin alone and PAS group. But most importantly, streptomycin resistance in two-thirds of the streptomycin alone patients and only 10% of the PAS streptomycin patients. On five-year follow-up, a third or more of the PAS and streptomycin alone group had died, only 19% of the PAS streptomycin group and the principle of combination anti-tuberculosis therapy was established. Um, it was this figure which uh, stimulated us to actually go and have a look at what we're doing currently, as this figure of survival after five years is quite a lot better than our current management of multi-drug and, ex and ex extensively drug-resistant mm -hmm. tuberculosis. Okay, in the next study which involved PAS, they looked at different dosages 5, 10, and 20 grams with, the, with, a, with a, a, the same dosage of streptomycin in each case. But these dosages were four times one, four times, sorry, f four times 1.25 grams, four times 2.5, and four times five. So e in each of these patient groups, the patients were arguably exposed to higher T max concentrations of the PAS. At six months uh, ass 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 assessment, there were almost no deaths. Streptomycin resistance emerged in 36% of the PAS 5 gram group, 30% of the PAS 10 gram group, but only 7% of the 20 gram patients. Now, in the meantime, isoniazid had arrived on the scene, and this, of course, is a much more powerful drug than either streptomycin or PAS. And there was a, a great deal of interest. I think I skipped the paper. Well, I think I've left something out there, but never mind. Um, it was, there, was, there was a great deal of interest in... I'm not make, having more success here. Right, okay, there we go. Uh, okay, uh, with uh, isoniazid around, there was quite, a, and, and PAS, there was quite a lot of interest in a, a totally oral regimen, which would have obvious advantages. Um, so they looked at isoniazid 200 milligrams in two equal doses. So quite a lot of our early uh, treatment of tuberculosis was for intermittent therapy, because it was thought that was the way to do it then. PAS was then given in 10 grams or 20 grams, 
this being two equal doses, so it's five grams times two, and now five grams times four. So the C max concentrations in these patients were arguably, again, fairly close to one another, as opposed to the previous study. And at the end of three months, about th three quarters of the patients in both groups were bacteriologically negative. There was almost no emergence of resistance. Two patients in the PAS 10 gram group acquired isomerized resistance. So from this point onward, sodium PAS uh, was given in 10 to 12 grams daily in two to three doses. And in more recent recommendations, this has been reduced in some cases to 8 grams times 2 4 gram doses. Right, now a, a, a quick look at, at, at uh, the sodium pass pharmacokinetics. This is a study done by Citroen and Cooper in, in uh, Britain. Um, and they looked at a number of different formulations. At one time, there were about 60 different formulations of pass doing the rounds. So, but they looked at sodium pass, 5 grams, and they had the C max was at about two hours um, with this preparation, and the C max con concentrations were a mean of 100 micrograms per mil, with the lowest C maxes being in the region of 50 micrograms per mil. And in their paper, they suggest that these are the concentrations that we should aim at when we are using PAS. So this is not a direct evaluation of efficacy, but a, a uh, interpretation of their results. Intolerance is an acknowledged problem. And I don't want to say too much about it because I think we all recognize it, but it's interesting that in early studies, it was very high. Half of the patients who got PAS in the United States refused to take it. In some of the European studies, however, it was much lower. There's a resume of this in a paper which will be in Lancet Infectious Diseases in a week's time, I think, um, if you want to look up all of the references. Okay. Uh, now... Although PAS was being used in divided doses, there were a number of re researchers who reported better or equivalent intolerance with once daily PAS. Uh, I'm not trying to go into it more, but the, the references are provided here. Uh, and recently, when they looked at XDR patients in, in South Africa who had been taking PAS and had PAS withdrawn, the figure was 6.9%. Looking over many studies in the literature, the proportion was about 10% of patients who had to stop PAS. So intolerance is a problem. Pharmacokinetics. Acetylation of the amino group uh, of the PAS molecule to form acetyl PAS and conjugation of a carboxyl group to form glycine PAS are the two commonest means of ex excretion for PAS. These activities are strongly influenced by dosage. At low dosage, PAS is rapidly absorbed and it's equally rapidly acetylated. So the PAS concentrations don't get very high and your PAS concentrations and acetyl PAS concentrations will be almost the same. And I'll show you a figure now. So I've done that again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of Jorge Lemon's last papers in uh, 1969 had this figure, which shows you the effect of different dosages and the effect on the concentrations in acetyl and glycine PAS. Okay. This is 100 micrograms per mole here, which I've I'm not trying to say that this is what you should aim at, but it's what s people have suggested is not a bad uh, concentration to aim at. And it forms a bit of a, a continuing uh, focus in some of the other slides, which I will show you. Okay, so there's 100, 4 grams, 8 grams, 12 grams, sodium pass in one dose, fairly rapid absorption, C max of 2 hours, and concentrations, mean C max concentrations, 100, 150, 200 micrograms per mole. This here is glycine pass, and you can see how it gets more and more, and how the acetyl pass starts to rise towards the end there as the concentrations are, are, are falling. This is probably due to in, uh, in the uh, lack of acetyl CoA for the acetylation process. Now, we usually think of pass as a bacteriostatic drug. If you look at the literature, this can be questioned. This is the very first study which was done in Sweden where the drug was, was initially used. This was a, a blinded um, placebo-controlled trial. So they didn't just put the patients in the bed and give PAS to the one group. They had a placebo which they were matched with. So here you see the percentage of smears containing acid fast bacilli. Uh, there's four weeks there. This is the PAS group. That's the placebo group. And you can see a fairly marked fall in acid fast bacilli. And there were several other um, studies in the literature where this is also evident. Here we have PAS given in monotherapy again in a study carried out in Germany, published 1969. 
discuss those as the four grams, two statistical methods used here to analyze. And again, one, two, three, four, five weeks, six weeks, and you'll see a fall in acid fat bacilli. The same group again in Germany, PAS intravenously, and I think PAS is still being used intravenously in Europe in some, in some uh, sites. Ethionomate cytoserum, and most interestingly, iron 8. So the PAS IV, which will arguably give you very high concentrations, is giving you a fall in acid fast bacilli, which is parallel to that of iron 8. Obviously, they've got different starting points here. So, and, and then lastly, quite a well-known study of Amina Jindani and Dennis Mitchison, uh, one of the most often quoted early bactericidal activity studies, uh, and has, has been overlooked that there was a PAS group in this study that got 15 grams PAS in a single daily dose. And the EDA naught for two days was 0.26 log 10 CFU mils per student per day. In other words, a quarter of a log of acid bifast bacilli or, uh, sorry, viable colony forming units were removed from the student by the drug. Now, all of this says to me that we're not necessarily here dealing with a bacteriostatic drug. And quite likely, if you can give enough of the drug, it's actually bactericidal. Okay, with the, with the development of rifampicin and rifampitol pyrazinamide, the use of PAS dropped dramatically and it became almost unobtainable. And I think from the patient's point of view, it was quite a good idea. You know, no one enjoyed the nausea. In 1994, under the influence of the spread of HIV and the accompanying XDR and MDR um, uh, epidemics, a new gastro-resistant granule formulation was introduced in the United States and was used in... Uh, in the management of MDR and XDR patients. Now, the idea of this was that you would give a slow release of PAS, a prolonged period of PAS at concentrations above two micrograms per mole. So there was no, wasn't great concern here about how high it should go, but rather that on the basis that we're dealing with a bacteriostatic drug, that it would be um, maintain a, a concentration above two micrograms per mole. Uh, Chuck Felicton has done a couple of um, uh, pharmacokinetic studies. He's the doyen of American anti-tuberculosis drug uh, uh, um, pharmacists or pharmacology experts. Pharmacists is not the right word. <laughs> um, and here you see a single dose of the new uh, granular preparation, four grams. Uh, this is eight hours here. I apologize for the figure. I've colored in the acetyl pass here. And here is the pass itself. And here you see 12 micrograms per mole. Uh, and what I wanted to show here was that the acetyl pass rises just about as high as the pass does in the, at this very low, at this low <coughs> dosage. He did a, several more multi-dose multi studies where the pass concentration reached about 20 micrograms per mole in their patients. Right. Okay, so now we come to what we did. And I've got another eight minutes. Hmm? Something like that, yeah. Yes, because you, 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 you're late. Okay, right. We're going to keep on racing along. <laughs> uh, okay, this was a two-period open-label crossover study, 32 patients, and they were randomized to receive one of two regimens, and they were randomized also to receive it um, either as the first option or the second option. So that, and then they were crossed over after they'd got the one uh, uh, um, regimen. Eight grams once in the morning, four, to four grams 12 hourly. And we took blood at nine occasions. We did HPLC tandem MS uh, analysis of the PAS concentrations, unfortunately not the acetyl PAS. And we assessed intolerance by visual analog scale. I think most of you will be familiar with that, and I don't think there's time to really go into too much, but we asked the patients to rate how sick they were at the end of each day, how nauseous they were. This is the broad uh, pharmacokinetic CMAX AUC um, 12 hour concentrations. You see four grams twice daily, eight grams once daily, and the eight gram once daily patients not unexpectedly had higher concentrations. And conversely, if you look at the uh, concentration at 12 hours, the concentration at 24 hours in the four gram twice daily group, it's higher than in the eight gram once daily group. It's interesting to look at the actual line graphs, and I think this gives you a much clearer picture of what's going on. This is four grams past 12 hourly. Here's 50 micrograms per mole, 100 micrograms per mole. And depending upon how you look at this, you can interpret it. Nearly all these patients will have concentrations consistently above two micrograms per mole. 
There are a couple of patients here who get to over 100, and some patients are getting above 50 micrograms per mole. Here is the 8 grams passed once daily. Some patients getting over 100, all of them getting over 50, but some, quite a lot of them getting to naught at 24 hours. So I think I've told you this. We needn't spend too much time on this. Uh, some interesting uh, PK findings. Women had significantly higher C-max concentrations and AUC uh, 0 to 12 hours than men. Here you see the men and the women, C-max, AUC 0 to 12, 8 grams, 4 grams, and the women have higher concentrations than the men. Our statisticians corrected these for body weight, as that might have been a confounding variable. Intolerance, uh, 4 grams to the left, 8 grams to the right. Uh, first of all, occurrence. Quite high levels of, of occurrence, as one would expect, but this is a fairly liberal documentation of intolerance. You just had to say you felt nauseous once, and it was noted as having occurred. One of the important things to note is that the 8 grams once daily patients had no worse uh, frequency of intolerance than the 4 gram patients, and in fact some of the findings are a bit less. If you look at, uh, at severity, uh, 4 grams to the left again, 8 grams right. These are the, the median VAS scores in the range, and from the median scores you can see that no one actually rated their experience too badly. The range tells you, actually no one's not the correct word, sorry, there are individual patients who have high scores, but the mean scores, median scores, are very low. If you want a line drawing to make it clearer, I often find line drawings and things like that easier to understand. Uh, you can see that the means, again, are very low. Uh, I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly. I think I've showed you the basic data. This is <coughs> diarrhea and nausea, and there were more patients who complained more, more uh, vocally of uh, diarrhea and nausea than there were of the other um, uh, factors of intolerance. Majority of patients had no vomiting and the observed median frequency of vomiting was naught. Uh, the percentage of patients complaining of, of uh, intolerance was lower in women than men, despite them having higher concentrations, uh, but only in the case of uh, abdominal pain and cramps and nausea was it higher. Our statistician who was a woman said she always knew women were tougher than men. And okay, I've got to get through here. <laughs> I'm being threatened. <laughs> uh, Okay, so I, I've virtually told you this, that there is, there is no relationship between the um, uh, intolerance and the PK. Genetics, the expected proportion of slow acetylators here, uh, and the genotype, this is the past concentrations, 100 micrograms per mole there, with the number of alleles carried. And uh, there was another gene which we identified, NAT1103, which uh, also had a slow uh, phenotype, uh, this hasn't been seen clinically before. It's been described in in vitro uh, um, situations. The NAT2, there was an intriguing association between some of the NAT2 uh, um, alleles, and we had a very high proportion of fast acetylators, as one would expect in a southern African population. Uh, NAT2S1, higher concentrations, and NAT2S2, lower concentrations. Uh, HIV infection, lower concentrations, but not significantly so. And then very quickly, I want to draw attention to the mutant detection concentration. In this study here, the, the, this a particular gene was investigated, the mutants. They had very high MICs, 128 micrograms per mole. So you'd have to get much more PAS than we did to actually exceed that MIC. But they did note that the growth of PAS isolate encoding wild-type proteins was dose-dependent in its response to PAS. And this is a very recent European study uh, from Eric Botker's laboratory in Zurich. PAS susceptibility from a number of European laboratories. He asked them to do MICs on all of the MDR, XDR isolates. And the uh, chairman is looking at his watch. Um, and what I want you to note is the more than half of the PAS-resistant isolates have concentrations less than 64 micrograms per mole. So if you give a higher dose, you're going to exceed those. And so, conclusions. PAS is usually classified as bacteriostatic, but I think there's quite good evidence that it's bacteriocidal. Intolerance to PAS is probably no worse following once a day dosing than multiple dosing. And I think then for certain groups of patients who've got to be treated for MDR, XDR, I would go for the highest dose that those patients can tolerate. 
I, th I don't think on the data we have we can prescribe what the dosage should be, but I think if the patient can tolerate more, give them more. Okay. Uh, right, we can leave it at that. An acid fast bacilli from Cape Town. Thank you. because there's actually no data. You see, that this is a situation in which antituberculosis chemotherapy finds itself. That we're now reaching about 70 years, 40 years of drug that's being made positively, which is never really thoroughly investigated. And uh, on reading the literature and just our experience here, we feel that if you're going to manage multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, and it's an NDR and it's FCR patients that need help, well, uh, it's dependent on us. And we have the recommendation from WHO and from other authorities that you actually give a really low dose. As I half jokingly say, a captured cold. Whereas my interpretation of the literature is the more you can give, the better your results are probably going to be. And if your patient can tolerate it, and I think our experience here shows, and the extensive experience in the older literature, shows that you can go quite high with some patients. In fact, with the majority of patients. And I think from the evidence that I see that I would prefer to give a much higher dose. And if you compare PATH to the aminoglycoside, if you use amikacin or tamamycin to treat your tuberculosis patients, the NDR patients, about a quarter of the patients, a third become deaf. I would rather have nausea and diarrhea for six months than be permanently deaf. You, 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 you're talking about patients who have no <laughs> other therapeutic recourse. They are, th they are th therapeutically destitute, to put it bluntly. So you, you're talking about their last port of call. The only pharmaceutical company we've had any interaction with is are the manufacturers of, of, of PESA. And we've had that interaction because they, they came to us when we published our results because they were interested in them. But um, their, their, their uh, current formulation was drawn up on the, suppo on the supposition that PES is a bacteriostatic drug and that you have to prevent intolerance as much as possible and keep the concentration as low as possible. And I don't think that's true. But now, because PAS was last investigated 50 years ago in any thorough manner, I can't offer you a guarantee that what I'm saying is, is therapeutically true, but I suspect very much that it would be. Uh, and we need to do the studies. But there's a lot of competition now for doing studies and for facilities with the newer drugs, which is quite appropriate. I, I have no argument with that. But if you have to use PAS, I feel very strongly give as much as you can. Yeah, 
Because uh, I tell you, the, the, the question was about whether we could use uh, atomizer, or whether you could use test with atomizer in the sample chain. I think if you're using, uh, if your patients are susceptible to isomizers in the sample chain, then as a first line drug, test has no role. Its role is in patients who've got isomizers in the sample chain will be resistance. And even there, you possibly have enough reserve drugs. But once you get to your XDR patients, where they've lost the four alkenolines, they've lost the amino glycosides, then you really, you're down to drugs like cyclosterin. Uh, you're scraping the barrel with, 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 uh, with amoxyl and tabulonic acid. And I think that TAS is one of the last drugs that, that those patients have. Uh, and under those circumstances, I think we should be, you know, using it at as high of, high of the doses as we can. We need to collect more data, obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Peter.